Welcome to Centaur Financial Services Podcast. The information provided on and made available through this video and podcast does not constitute as financial product advice. The information is of a general nature only and does not take into account your individual objectives, financial situation or needs. It should not be used, relied upon or treated as a substitute for specific professional advice. We recommend that you obtain your own independent professional advice before making any decision in relation to your particular requirements or circumstances. Hi everyone, Hugh Robertson here. You know that I'm always saying that at Centaur we have the best clients in the world and we always want to bring you the best insights that we can to give you the greater clarity and confidence over your financial future. There's just been so much noise out there this year, you know, 2024, uh, around geopolitical tension, around an election, around the valuation of stocks, in particular the US. There's a, there's a lot of noise out there and I really want to, to be able to deliver expert views to you so that you have greater peace of mind and a bit of greater confidence about how your money is being managed. So it's with great pleasure today uh, that we've been able to get one of the best speakers in the world, in my opinion, uh, on investment markets, uh, Ron Temple. Ron, I've seen Ron personally on Bloomberg, CNBC. I've been lucky to sit next to him at a conference. I've heard him speak at conferences. And he has a really great way of capturing what's going on at the macro level and explain how that relates to us and just gives us greater clarity over what's going on in the world and what are the actual things we should be worried about versus just the massive amounts of noise that are currently out there. Uh, very fortunate today, and he's going to give us a bit of an around the ground. We've got 30 minutes, so I'm going to give a quick bio and then I'm just going to go throw straight to Ron. So Ron is the Chief Market Strategist for Lazard's uh, Global Financial Advisory and Asset Management Businesses. Uh, Ron provides macroeconomic and market perspectives to Lazard's investment teams, of which one of those sits in our portfolios. Uh, and he works closely with their uh, Lazard's Geopolitical Advisory Group to assess economic and market implications of key geopolitical issues uh, globally. So with all of his insights, he's gonna be able to help us with what's going on with US equity strategies, multi-asset invest investments. Uh, he has been at Lazard since 2001. Uh, so he's a stayer, uh, which we like, and he's seen a lot. And he's got his, I know he went to Duke University as I've talked to him a little bit about that. Uh, he also has an MPP from Harvard University uh, and I think he now, correct me if I'm wrong, but you, see, you sit on a chair of Duke still now? Uh, I just completed six years as chair of the board of visitors for the graduate school. So overseeing all the programs that grant PhDs and master's degrees. So not only does he have real world experience, uh, he also cares very much about education and current uh, academic views of asset allocation and portfolio construction. So that's enough waffling on for me. I'm very Proud that we're able to get Ron Temple here today. Ron, thank you very much for coming here. Pleasure to be here. Thanks, Hugh. Thanks for the really kind introduction. And and let's dive right into the content and hopefully get some time for questions as well. I'm going to share my screen. And while I'm doing that, I just want to point out, I, I, Hugh asked me today to really focus more on the U.S. Um, so I don't want people to think that I'm a... Uh, one of the people who thinks the US is the end all and be all. So um, what you'll see here on this very first slide is we can talk to other regions like the Eurozone, China, Japan. But again, we wanted to focus on the US economy today and also spend a few minutes on the election because you know that is extremely topical in meetings around the world as investors think about this election. And I would note, by the way, historically, I would say that typically I tell people elections don't really move the needle on the US economy because you're basically talking about a U.S. economy that's 27 and a half trillion U.S. dollars. Um, this is a super tanker. It takes a long time to change the direction of the economy. You know, it takes a lot of fiscal policy. So generally, I would say presidential elections are kind of overhyped. Uh, in this case, I think that's not true. Um, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But maybe if we just start off on the on the U.S. So in a global context, you know, the big conversation for the last two years has been all about inflation. And I want to show you these two global charts. Apologies, Australia is not on the chart, but you know your inflation story here. But I wanted to show you basically the inflation problem was a global problem. You can see here on this chart, US, UK, Eurozone, all had very high inflation. It peaked anywhere from 9 to 
in, in all those cases, we're down to somewhere around 3% on headline inflation at this point. And in fact, even today, we got numbers out of Eurozone, uh, Germany, and Spain in terms of better inflation than expected. Um, if you look at it, excluding food and energy, again, same story, a global problem, not completely resolved, but largely resolved across major developed economies. And as you can note on the prior slide, in this slide, by the way, China is the outlier. China has not had an inflation problem at all. It's got maybe even a deflation problem. But if I drill into the U.S., you know, it's been really surprising, you know, with 525 basis points of rate hikes, $1.8 trillion of shrinkage of the Federal Reserve's balance sheet, the economy has been really resilient. And I'm in the camp, by the way, that I think the Fed has done a very good job. I mean, let's be honest, they were late to the party in terms of figuring out that inflation was a problem. I was also late to that party. If you go back to 2021, when inflation really started to ramp up in the U.S., it looked like it was going to be transitory, and maybe that's a good transition. If you look at this chart, what I've shown you is three different lines that are the three key categories of the core consumer price index in the United States. And so, again, core CPI excludes food and energy, and the reason we do that is those prices can be really volatile. So what we really want to capture is not commodity price volatility, but the, the broader economy. And what you see on this chart, the dark blue line is core goods. So think of this as all the physical stuff you buy other than food and energy. So it's basically everything from automobiles to musical instruments to computers, TVs, et cetera. And what you can see is basically until the pandemic, that line was generally at or below zero. So effectively, every year, prices of goods basically were flat to slightly down. And in fact, in the United States from 1999 to 2019, core goods inflation was zero for 20 years in total. What we saw during the pandemic, though, is we had a surge where inflation for core goods went up to 12% year on year. And what caused that? Well, it was two things. Number one is when we couldn't go out to restaurants, couldn't travel, people basically sat at home and bought more stuff online. So they bought more physical goods in lieu of services. So demand surged. At exactly the same time, we had this, the supply chain issues. We had semiconductor shortages, shipping disruptions, labor market problems. And that's how you got to 12% inflation in goods. Now, if you look at it, you can clearly see since then we've moved back into deflation. In fact, more significant deflation than we've seen at any point in the last 20 years, because a lot of those goods prices are now going back down in absolute terms. Now, I wouldn't tell you expect them to all go back down to where they used to be. You know, if you go to the grocery store, things are not going to go back to where they were necessarily five years ago. But we're seeing that kind of unwind of those supply chain issues. The problem is when goods prices were going up 12 percent, that kind of transmitted its way into the service sector. You can see on the light blue line, which is shelter, which is 46% of the core CPI in the United States, rent inflation basically got up to 8% year on year based on the way the Bureau of Labor Statistics measures inflation. It's now down to below six, and I'll tell you in a minute why I think it's going below four. The gold line is 31% of the core CPI. That service is excluding shelter. It peaked at six, it's now down below five. And what I watch here is on the month to month basis, this chart shows you the same three lines. And what you can see is in 13 of the last 14 months, core goods were at or below zero inflation. Again, that's the deflation you saw on the prior slide. But the gold line and the light blue line have been pretty stubborn, sticking around that 40, 50 basis points a month. And that's been the real challenge for the Fed is if the Federal Reserve wants to cut rates, they need to know that the service sector inflation has been dealt with. And you can see at the very right end of the chart, though, in the last few months, service sector inflation, excluding shelter, has basically been below zero for two months and back at 20 basis points in the month of July. That's a level the Fed can tolerate because 20 basis points a month is a level that would basically correlate to the Fed's 2% inflation target. Now, shelter has remained stubborn, as you can see in the light blue line, typically around 40 basis points. But what I'm showing you on this chart is the Zillow Observed Rent Index. This is a private sector index that tracks actual asking levels for rent. And so to say that again, this, this index only tracks asking rents for new leases. It does not include renewals for existing tenants. So because of that, it tends to lead the inflation measured by the CPI by about a year. And why is that the case? Imagine if you're a landlord, you own an apartment, you have a really good renter who pays on time every month, never complains. You might know that the market rent has gone up 20%, but you don't want to risk losing that good tenant. So maybe you raise the rent 10% and you plan to do it another 10% next year. 
you tend to have a bit of a lag on renewals in terms of catching up to the current market price. What you see on this Zillow index is for the last 13 months, rent inflation for asking rents on new leases in the U.S. has been at or below 3.5%. And so I think this is a very clear signal that we should expect inflation for shelter to go down. We've already had services excluding shelter go down, and we have core goods and deflation. So this is all positive in terms of the Fed defeating inflation. Now, the other piece of this, though, by the way, for the Fed, as it relates to services, has been concern over an excessively tight labor market. What you see here is the unemployment rate for the United States. We were at or below 4% unemployment for 30 consecutive months. In the last few months, that's bumped up to 4.3%. So you've had a 90 basis point increase of unemployment from the lows. Now, keep in mind, at 3.4%, which is where, where we were within the last 12 months, that was the lowest level of unemployment since 1969. So I always talk about this as easing of tightness in the labor market. This is not a weak labor market. It's still a strong labor market, just less strong than it was before. And you can kind of see that on this chart. If we look at job creation, we've been running at 233,000 jobs per month since the beginning of 2023. And just to give you context, historically in the US, you need about 130 to 140,000 jobs per month to keep up with population growth. Now, the reason we've had so much higher job growth over the last 18 months is we've had more immigration, both legal and not legal. And we've also had people come back into the labor market, people who had either retired early or basically had decided to take a break after we had that inflation wave and after we had the 2022 sell-off in equities and fixed income, some people realized maybe they made a mistake by retiring early. So you've had people come back into the labor market, more immigration, and we've been able to have strong job growth even while inflation came down. But what I watch to see if that tightness has eased enough for the Fed to be able to cut rates is this metric, which shows you the number of unfilled jobs in the U.S. divided by the number of unemployed people. So if you go back to February of 2022, two and a half years ago, the U.S. had two unfilled jobs for every unemployed worker. Now, clearly, if you're at the Fed, you're thinking, you know, this is really a, a stressful situation. That basically says that employers really have to pay up to fill those jobs. And if you have big wage gains, then that typically leads to higher price increases. So the decline from 2 to 1.14 is very encouraging. And again, back to my comment about it still being a tight labor market, 1.14 is close to the record high level we had seen before the pandemic. So again, still high levels of openings relative to, un to unemployed workers. But another metric I like to watch from the same survey is what percentage of workers quit their job every month. And what you can see here is again, back at the early part of 2022, 3% of American workers were quitting their job every month. That's now gone down to 2.1%. And by the way, if you own a small business or owned one in the past, 3% turnover every month implies 40% of your turnover of your employees leave each year. It's an incredibly high turnover rate. And typically, why do people leave? They leave because they're getting a big wage increase to go somewhere else. And so clearly, that's not an op option for a lot of workers today where it was two and a half years ago. And all that feeds into this chart, by the way, which is wage growth. And again, very important to the Fed. At the peak, we had three different data series here on this chart, all showing wage growth of anywhere from five to seven and a half percent. You can see all three of them have been decelerating over the last two and a half years, just like the percentage of people quitting has slowed down. And that says to the Fed, okay, if wage growth has come back down to somewhere around 4%, that actually can be aligned with a 2% inflation target because you get productivity growth combined with some level of wage increase or inflation to get to that 4% wage growth. Now, that's the economic part of the story in the U.S. And if I summarize it, I would say you've got a good story around inflation slowing down. You've got tightness in the labor market that is eased enough that the Fed can be confident that inflation will stay under control. And that all lays the groundwork for lowering interest rates over the next 12 to 18 months. But importantly, after we got the July unemployment report in the U.S., the market actually swung pretty severely to worrying about recession. I do not agree with that fear. I mean, there's always a risk of recession. Things can go wrong. I mean, obviously, easing of tightness in the labor market could actually transition to outright weakness. So I'm going to be watching, for example, next week, um, the August employment report. We're expecting 155,000 new jobs in the U.S., up from the 114,000 the prior month. If we get 150,000, give or take, that's a good number. That gives even more confidence that the risk of recession is low. 
So I think the U.S. is in a really good place here where we're unlikely to have recession, but we've had enough easing that you can cut rates. But importantly, given that I think recession risk is low, I don't think the Fed is going to be cutting rates to levels like 2% or even 3%. I think they're likely to only ease rates down to somewhere around three and a half to four because the entire reason they're easing is because of lower inflation and that they want to make sure that they don't have tight monetary policy too long and lead to fewer jobs they need to be created than could have been otherwise. Now, I do include this chart, by the way, just as a reminder, though, that there are risk. Um, what you see on this chart, by the way, is 90 plus day delinquencies on different types of consumer loans. And the one that really stands out is obviously the one on the top, which is credit cards. So this is considered seriously delinquent if you're three months past due. And we're back above 10% of all credit card balances in the US being past due on a record level of credit card debt. Now, what this tells me, by the way, along with the darker blue line below it, which is auto loans, is that at the lower end of the population in the US, people are having a harder time making ends meet because they're not getting the same size of wage gains that they were getting two years ago. It's not as easy to get a new job with a higher pay, and they basically spent down a lot of the savings they accumulated during the pandemic and have had to borrow money on credit cards. So, again, this is worth watching. I don't want to make it sound like everything's perfect in the U.S., and so there are potential areas of fragility, but so far, I think the net picture is quite positive. Now, that leads to the next big topic, though, and again, I said at the very beginning, historically, I would tell you, don't lose sleep over the U.S. election. The economy might move a little bit on the margin, but if you think about it, even if a president cuts tax rates or raises tax rates, it takes a long time for that to show up in the macro data. Well, in this election, I think it's different because the policy proposals coming from Donald Trump and Kamala Harris are very different. And I would say more that it's Trump being different. Kamala Harris is largely, I would say, status quo with the existing policies of the Biden administration with some nuances along the margin. But in case of Trump, um, he's proposed some pretty radical changes in policy, in particular around trade. And I'll come back to that in a moment. But one key point on the election is it's too early to call who's going to win. And what I've shown you on this chart is the key swing states. And importantly, a uh, few things I want to highlight. And again, most people I meet in Australia, by the way, know as much about American politics as Americans do. So I don't want to be patronizing. But I just want to point out, number one, the popular vote does not determine the presidency, right? Given the way the electoral college works in the US, for a Democrat to win the presidency, they typically need to win the popular vote by two to three percentage points. And the reason for that is just the way the electoral college is built. Your number of electoral votes is the sum of your seats in the Senate and the House. And so a state like Wyoming has two Senate seats and one House seat. California has two, two Senate seats but 40 or 50 House seats. But what that ends up doing is it basically means if you're a voter in Wyoming, you get a higher representation in the Electoral College than a voter in California. Frankly, the voter in, in Wyoming should be 150th of California, but instead they're 117th. So bottom line, those states that are less populated tend to be more Republican, which you see on the red states on the map. Those are the states Trump won last time. And it really all comes down to the seven swing states I've listed. And what you can see in those seven swing states is in six of the seven as of last week, Kamala Harris was ahead of Donald Trump. As of today, she's ahead in all seven. But the important thing to note is she's ahead by a margin that's within the margin of error in almost every state. And so right now, this is too close to call in terms of, in terms of who could win the president. Now, point number two after that, though, is I do think we can say that there's an 80% chance that the Republicans will control the Senate after this election. Right now, it's a 51-49 divide, but there are 23 Democrats up for re-election and only 10 Republicans. And one of those Democrats who has chosen to retire is from West Virginia, which is a state Donald Trump won by over 20 percentage points last election. It's a very Republican state. So I can guarantee you that that state will go Republican, which means you're 50-50. If the Democrats lose one other seat, it's a Republican Senate. So I think you can basically, basically plan on that being a Republican Senate and that really matters because what it means is if Kamala Harris does win the White House, it's unlikely she can pass any major, major legislation because the Republicans would block any big initiatives on her part. The one piece of legislation that is impactful that will pass is at the end of 2025, the tax cuts that were passed in the United States by Donald Trump in 2017 are all scheduled to expire for individuals. 
The corporate tax rate cuts are permanent. The individual income tax cuts were only through the end of 2025. Now, Kamala Harris has promised that she would not raise taxes on anyone making less than 400,000 US dollars a year. Same promise Joe Biden made. Theoretically, Donald Trump would extend all of the tax cuts, including for people over $400,000 per year. And if you're in case you're wondering, Americans make 400,000, it's about 1% of the population. So bottom line is even with the Republican Senate, they're gonna wanna extend those tax cuts. Kamala Harris wants to extend them for 99% of the population. But other than that legislation, I think you could write off any major accomplishments, at least in the first two years of her administration while there's a Republican Senate. Now, the House I've left out so far, I'm assuming whoever wins the presidency will also win the House because right now that's on a razor's edge. Everyone in the House gets reelected every two years. So I'm assuming if you get a Kamala Harris presidency, you get a Democratic House, Republican Senate, Democratic White House. However, if you get Donald Trump, you get a Republican House, Senate, and White House, which means he probably could pass his legislation, legislative initiatives. And what we've listed on the bottom right here in the box are some of the key things to watch. But I'd like to highlight, I think there are three major areas where Trump would most directly affect the economy and markets. And those are trade, taxes, and regulation. Now, trade is the most important one. So what you see on this chart on the left is currently the U.S. has an effective average tariff rate on imports of 3%. Donald Trump has pledged that he would impose a 10 to 20% tariff on all imports into the United States, regardless of the source. And he's also talked about a 60% tariff on imports from China. Now, let me put that in context. The U.S. imports $550 billion of goods from China, or did import $550 billion of goods last year from China. Aside from China, the U.S. imported $3.25 trillion of goods from the rest of the world. So $3.8 trillion of total imports, $550 billion of which was from China. What we show on the chart is if Trump actually enacted a 10% global tariff plus the 60% China tariff, our average tariff would go from 3% to 17%. The chart on the right shows you in the dark line, you have to go back to the 1930s, which is not on the chart, to get a tariff that high. So basically when we had the global trade war around the Great Depression, those are the levels of tariffs we're talking about. Since the 1950s, we've never been above 11%. Now to me, this is very important for investors. Number one, for the US economy, that magnitude of increase of tariffs would mean an increase of inflation, a reduction of GDP, and very importantly, a hit to corporate profit margins. So most economists focus on the inflation and GDP. I wanna focus your attention on profit margins because companies who have supply chains that are global cannot turn on a dime and suddenly shut off their Chinese imports in and go to Mexico or go to Thailand. And by the way, I would note, even if you do go from China to Mexico or Thailand, Trump has said there'll be a 10% increase in the tariff there. So this is something I think we need to be thinking about as we get closer to the election. And I would note, even if I'm wrong about the Republican House and Senate, the president lose tariffs without going through Congress. So this is an area where Trump has very strong authority, or Kamala Harris would. So this is something to watch. And by the way, I only talked about the U.S. impact. If the U.S. puts a 60% tariff on goods from China, UBS has estimated that that would reduce Chinese GDP by 250 basis points. It would be a very big hit to Chinese growth, and it would be a hit to Chinese inflation, which is already close to being in deflation, would probably move into that territory. Now, the other area, by the way, that people ask about a lot is climate change and the Inflation Reduction Act. I would just note, I do not think Donald Trump would repeal the IRA. This map shows you where the biggest amounts of spending have been from the IRA. And you'll note, Texas and Florida, both Republican states, have had $130 billion. New York and California, Democratic states, have only had $55 billion. You're unlikely to take that money away from your own states. Two other quick topics on the election, and I'm going to wrap up. Um, number, the second one is taxes. I already covered that relative to Kamala versus Trump. So not a lot of daylight between the two of them, but Donald Trump has said he would like to lower corporate taxes from 21% to 15. That would imply a five percentage point increase in S&P earnings. So some partial positive offset to the pain caused by the tariffs. And then the third area is he would likely deregulate areas around financial services and energy, which would be positive for those companies. Um, and there would be a mixed reaction in the healthcare sector. So what does the market say about all of this? Well, number one, I talked about Fed policy easing. I think the Fed will cut rates starting in September. We'll get 25 basis points at each meeting this year. 
The market's saying we're going to get 100 basis points by the end of the year. I think we get 75. The market is saying the Fed will cut by 200 basis points by July 30th of 2025. I don't think the Fed will cut that much in the entire cycle. So I think the market's a little ahead of itself on interest rate reductions. Um, credit markets, by the way, what you see on this chart and the next chart is the cost of buying protection against defaults in the credit default swap market. Both charts show lower levels of cost. That means less likelihood of recession and defaults. So I think that's probably right. Markets are saying the ECB will cut rates two to three times in the rest of the year. I think it's three times again, so probably about right in that case. And when you think about what this means for what you want to own in fixed income, I would say I think long duration fixed income is unattractive at this point. My view is fair value on the US 10 year treasury is probably closer to four and a half percent versus the 3.8 percent where we're trading today. So I would say if you get a bump up in yields over the next one, two years, maybe that's a good time to think about buying longer duration treasuries. But for now, I would stick with shorter maturities and I would stay with investment grade corporates because you get a yield pickup. In the equity markets, by the way, this chart shows you on the left US equity indices, price to earnings ratios, the right is non US. US is materially more expensive. What you can see on the left is it's largely driven by tech. And let me jump ahead here. I want to show you this kind of what's happened in the market over the last two and a half years. What you see on this chart, courtesy of our friends at UBS, is the starting point is the prior market peak at the end of 2021. And this is a chart just for the big six tech stocks in the US. So it's a MAG7 minus Tesla. What you can see in the font in the upper right in red is the sell off from the end of 21 to the bottom in October of 22. The green is the rally since October of 22. The gold is the combination. The summary here, the punchline is those six tech stocks through the end of July. We're up 41%, but their earnings have grown 60%. So their PE ratio, the price to earnings ratio, had actually declined by 4.4 points. So these stocks have actually gotten cheaper in theory, even though they've gone up 41%. The rest of the market, however, is only up 6.5% since the end of 2021. The earnings are only up 8%, so they've derated by half a PE multiple. Now, what's interesting here, by the way, keep in mind at the beginning of 2021, the 10-year Treasury yield was 1.5%, not 3.8%. So you've got a risk-free alternative at two and a half times the yield, and yet the rest of the market's kind of gone sideways. To me, the key of thinking about the equity market going forward is that these stocks are likely to see their earnings growth accelerate. And in fact, if you look at the fourth quarter of this year, the market expectation is that the big six tech stocks will grow earnings somewhere around 18 to 20%, but the other 494 stocks will grow earnings about 10%. In the second quarter that just ended, to give you the comparison, the six tech stocks had earnings growth of over 40%. The rest of the market was five. So I do think you're going to see a changing market over the years ahead. You're going to see a broadening out of earnings growth, broadening of participation. And I've listed here some things I like and don't like, but I want to cut it there so I give Hugh some time for us for questions. I'm going to stop sharing the slide and hand it over to you, Hugh. <laughs> That's incredible. And I, I, I do appreciate the comment you know, spending some time around the US election because it is something is topical and I know it does impact markets, you know, as much as we'd like to say that we aren't correlated to America, it is still true that when America sneezes, we all catch the cold. Uh, when you're talking about tech, so can this tech run continue? Tech stocks, that magnificent seven, mm -hmm. NVIDIA came out with pretty good results yesterday and their, their share price has gone down two days in a row since, or three days now. So can the tech run continue in your view? This quick answer is yes. Um, and, and the reason I say yes, I mean, I'm not saying it will continue, but it can. So I'm glad you said can it. Um, my legal compliance team would catch on to that. Um, bottom line, the reason I say it can, though, is when I step back and think about what we're in the midst of, there, there are two once in a lifetime megatrends that are basically going to continue for, I think, decades. One is the energy transition, because there's no avoiding that we're going to have to deal with these issues around climate. And the other is AI. And so if you think about it, AI, we're only two years into this story. I mean, people have been working on AI for 20 years, right? But the real breakthrough around ChatGPT and these other large language models really kind of came out around two years ago. Mm -hmm. And if we're really that early in this process, I think it's premature to be saying it's all over because you've had two years of upside in the stock prices. What I do think, though, is the only way it can be sustained, the only way that kind of earnings growth I just showed you can be sustained, well, Part one is, I don't think that 60% earnings growth in the last two and a half years will be repeated. Keep in mind, there were some big cost-cutting programs during that period, 
lots of headcount reductions because these tech companies had hired way too many people during the pandemic. So it's not just AI that made those earnings grow. You also have basically big hyperscalers, as they're called, buying tons of tech equipment for AI. But what we haven't seen yet is a return on that investment. So the key linchpin, in my view, for the big tech stocks to keep working is the customers buying all of those goods and services have to see some payoff from it. And by the way, you've got companies well outside of tech spending hundreds of millions, billions of dollars on AI and tech. And I think over the next one, two years, if you don't start seeing a return on investment, those companies are going to rein that spending back in, right? So that's the only way you get these six stocks to keep working. Now, importantly, though, if companies do start to see an ROI on that investment, a return on investment, maybe they ramp up spending even more. So, so I'm not willing to say it's all got to end because these stocks are at 30 times earnings. You know, as you saw in the chart I showed you, two and a half, took two years ago, they were at 34 times earnings. And yeah. so, you know, I want to be a little careful there. So what my advice typically is, is you don't want to be short the big tech stocks. I mean, you want some exposure, but you want to be selective. And maybe the next leg of the whole AI story is figuring out, okay, which companies are going to get the best return on that investment? You know, our number of our portfolio managers view is that healthcare sector could be the most disruptive in a positive way. I think, you know, I think 5% of new drugs actually work out. Well, what if you could raise that to 10? Um, you know, so I think there could be massive impacts across a range of sectors. And maybe the next part of this story is finding who's going to win from using their products as opposed to just betting on the people building the railroads, figure out who's going to ride those rails to profit. Yes, I like that. Thank you. These, one of the issues, I suppose, we, we keep worrying about the share market possibly going down because of the level of debt that governments have. And people mm -hmm. constantly reference the amount of debt that we've got. You know, in the GFC, the households had a lot of debt. And, you know, corporates had some debt. And then, you know, the GFC hit, global financial crisis hit. Now it seems there's all this government debt out there. You know, I think this is the most there's ever been in government debt. Yeah. But can those deficits continue? And why is that different to the GFC? Yeah, so this is probably one of the questions I get the most globally is how long, and, and typically it's a US focused question, but it's not just the US, as you say, it's, it's across developed economies. You know, you go back pre-pandemic, we all worried about Europe, right? Because these European countries had really high debt to GDP. It was Greece, then it was Italy, the French have the levels that are high. Interestingly, the Europeans are still running deficits that are too high relative to the growth of their economy, but the US is running even bigger deficits. So if you look at the Congressional Budget Office forecast for the next decade, the forecast is that every year for the next 10 years, the US deficit will be at least 6% of GDP. And that assumes no recession. So by the way, if you have a summer recession, it could be 10%. And so the question I get is how long can this be sustained? And the answer is, I don't know. I know in theory, it's not sustainable and I can dig into why, but the bottom line is the US has a public you know, debt held by the public of government debt is, sorry, the amount of government debt held by the public is roughly equivalent to GDP. It's about hundred percent of GDP. But based on my expectations and the CBO forecast by the end of 10 years, that could be 125% of GDP. And the higher you get, the harder it is to dig your way out of that debt. And so it's hard to say what would end it, but I can tell you one scenario that I do worry deeply could end it is one other part of this election is Trump has also speculated about having the Federal Reserve have to get presidential approval for monetary policy changes. If there's any hint that the Fed is losing its independence, that could be the U.S.'s Liz Truss moment, right? And and I do have a little pity for Liz Truss as a prime minister because she was there for all of seven weeks, and that's what we remember. But bottom line, if markets start to think, A, the U.S. is never going to deal with its deficit, and B, it's going to have a Federal Reserve that's under political control, and by the way, it doesn't matter whether it's Trump or Harris or any other president, I don't think any investor should want political influence over a central bank. That has never worked out well. And so, you know, I think that could be a risk factor to watch that could really um, derail kind of the market stability around these levels of deficits. That's correct. I think my camera's now officially switched off and gone to sleep. Um, so I might, on that note, uh, thank you so much for your, your time. I'm, I would love to have you back this time next year, maybe once the elections are done and 
see what the new narratives are, if inflation's under control, interest rates. Uh, it's always, there's always new narratives, there's always new issues. Mm. Um, but hopefully, what are your key takeouts for clients? So I've got, a, I've got yeah. clients who are retirees with their portfolio. What's the key takeout for them? Yeah, so I thank you for that because I don't want to end on a note of the Fed losing its independence and it all goes wrong. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I think the key takeaway here is, A, you know, unlike any prior election, this election might actually be the most consequential from an economic market perspective. But what does that mean to you? Does it mean you should be selling things? Does it mean you go to cash? I think the answer is no. I mean, it, what it means to me is, you know, we want to be a little more um, cautious or introspective about thinking about different scenarios and how it might affect different companies. But it's probably, you know, A, a strong case for having more of your assets and actively managed strategies where people can think about this as opposed to just owning everything. Um, it also could be an argument, by the way, for having a little more exposure in small cap equities. You know, they're less exposed in many cases to global trade, so a little, little more insulated from some of these tariffs. Um, and to retaliation that might come from trading counterparties. Typically, small caps also do better when interest rates go down because they have more debt. Um, and so, you know, I think this is also a reminder that you really want to focus on the valuation of what you own and the quality of what you own as well. So, you know, again, on average, over time, equity markets do go up and companies do adapt to changing political backdrops. And so I guess the last thing I would say is, Always keep in mind that long term perspective on a 3 to 5 year view. You might have some volatility over the next few months around the US election around policy changes that might come as a result of that election. But companies figure out how to work through that and you want to stay invested in the equity market. And fortunately for all of us too, by the way, to the extent you do decide to de risk a little bit. At least you can actually get a positive real yield out of government debt and corporate debt, which was not the case for several years during the pandemic. So. So it might sound like a treacherous time, but I think there's a lot of opportunity in these markets. The key is just to, you know, keep reminding yourself there are more than six stocks in the global equity market. There are probably more like 6,000 stocks you can own. So, so expand your horizons and stay invested would be my takeaway. Ron, thank you so much for your time. I think that's the clients are spoiled uh, to have your time and your wisdom there. So thank you very much. Hope you, hope we see you in person one time next time you're in Australia. Me too. Thanks a lot, Hugh. I really appreciate the opportunity to join you today. Thank you. Bye.